Part 12. Collective Security The state's primary function is to protect itself and its people against an external threat. However, the supernatural coalition now provides more order than an army of an autocrat who can direct troops to anonymously capture a weak territory. Some countries are eager to start a war but cannot find an excuse for it. The Budapest Memorandum violation is a good reason for a nuclear strike. Russian warships located in the northern seas also left their military base for a reason during the Crimean operation in the Black Sea. The same happened to aviation which was withdrawn to the expeditionary airfields and to the ground troops which were dispersed. The army was saved from a potential strike and the authorities avoided a contagious example of an anti-kleptocracy riot. This way the military command made it clear they were ready to scarify and incur significant losses on their territory and place the country on a war footing. Fortunately for us, there were no other leaders who were willing to fight the warfare of that scale at that moment. In the case of a military engagement between racketeers, their victims may spontaneously sabotage the warfare. After all, isn't it an act of bravery to save the symbiotic system from consequential radioactive ash? People act according to motivations, not on declarations. It's boring to think about voters' needs. The most exciting thing a politician can do is to seize and divide. Seize and divide money, fame, and opportunities. At the same time, the best politicians start playing Sim City while the worst ones play Red Alert. A war allows tighter commanding, giving less, taking away more quickly, and writing off more. If one can inherit property without inheriting responsibility, it's good to have an invader for a president and a criminal for a father. If they abandon the heritage by taking risks, they will provide a competitive advantage to their descendants. Alfred Nobel showed an example of how one can prepare the assets to be left as a legacy.